Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. This rigorous reading webinar will be brought to you today by the Alaska Department of Education and Early Development and the Alaska Comprehensive Center. Today's webinar is focused on fluency, and it is the third in a series of six webinars. The first webinar was phonemic awareness. The second was phonics and advanced phonics. Today is fluency. You will also see that there is vocabulary, in, uh, comprehension, and also um, secondary reading instruction. So we're very happy to see you, and let's get started. Every now and then I'm going to ask you to pause and either talk to your partner or think a moment with yourself and um, do a bit of reflection. So when I do that, will you just please pause the webinar and turn and talk to your partners or your group or do some self-reflection and um, then we will be ready to get back together and continue on with the content. So if you'll just hit the pause button, have your conversation, restart the webinar, then you'll be ready to go. Thank you so much. So today we are working on the concept of fluency is more than reading fast. Our objectives today are to really understand the multiple factors that interact with fluency, um, both at the skill level and at the passage level. Also to think a little bit about universal screening assessments and how they may be helpful in looking for fluency issues and for struggling kids, um, what might be the, the underlying root cause for those students. Also, why we would use the universal screening measure to, to notice um, reading difficulties for kids and why fluency happens to be a key indicator. Then I will share fluency building strategies for you that you can use in your classroom, uh, both in core instruction and with intervention to improve both rate and expression with fluency. So um, one of the misperceptions with fluency is that it's really just about reading fast. And fluency is much more than reading fast when we really dig deep and figure out what does the word fluency mean, how does it relate to reading, how do we provide instruction and support to build students' automaticity, uh, it's much, much more than just reading fast. This cartoon pretty much depicts uh, one of the issues that happens with poor fluency. I'll give you a minute to read it. When students have a need to reread and reread and reread, it is often an indicator that their fluency uh, is not quite where it should be and that their comprehension is being compromised because they aren't able to really take in the totality of the text. So that, that cartoon depicts that a little bit. So I want you to take a moment and think about, with a partner or with yourself, how would you define fluency? There are lots of different um, definitions out there, and we want to be really sure that we've got one that's tight and based on research. So talk with your partner. In a moment, pause the webinar, talk with your partner, and how would you define fluency? And please list out what are the attributes of a fluent reader. I'm going to give you about four minutes for this, so please be sure you get both tasks done, and then we will come back together. Great. Welcome back, everyone. Now that you have taken a moment to define your, your definition of fluency and listed out the attributes of a fluent reader, let's take a look at some other definitions that have been put together. So the National Reading Panel speaks that fluency is the ability to read text quickly, accurately, and with proper expression. When we look at some research done um, in 2005, the definition is that reading fluency refers to efficient, effective word recognition skills that permit a reader to construct the meaning of a text. Fluency is manifested in accurate, rapid, expressive oral language and is applied during and makes possible silent reading comprehension. So there's a lot tucked into that definition. 
there are some key words that I would love you to underline. Number one, efficient. Number two, effective. Number three, construct the meaning of a text. Number four, it's manifested in accuracy and rapid, expressive oral reading. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today in our webinar. And it's uh, applied while, while you are reading, either silently or out loud. And then Myers and Felton that defined it, the ability to read connected text rapidly, smoothly, and effortlessly with little attention to the mechanics of reach, such as decoding. So many times, <coughs> excuse me, when we visit, we visit about the speed or the rate, and we visit uh, about the rapidity, of being rapid. While we work with the idea of fluency, we need to be really cognizant of, the, of two other words. One is accuracy, and the other is um, effortless, uh, smoothness or expression. And that's called prosody, P-R-O-S-O-D-Y. And prosody is being able to read with smooth, expressive reading, attending to punctuation, reading like a river, reading with rhythm. So these are a few definitions that come from research, and I'm hoping that some of your definitions have similar words within them and that your characteristics of a fluent reader include some of these words. Let's look for a minute at what disfluent readers tend to do. So disfluent readers read with great effort, and they actually read word by word instead of phrases or chunks. They also tend to fail uh, to notice punctuation or intonation. For example, with a question mark, they tend not to um, bring their voice up at the end. With an exclamation, they tend not to read it with excitement. And they might attempt to sound out irregular words. Their sense of which words are, should be decoded and which words should be automatic sight words is not strong enough yet. <clears throat> they also may reread phrases or sentences over and over again, just as we read, saw in the cartoon. Um, one of the characteristics of a disfluent reader is needing to read the sentence or the phrase over and over. Typically, disfluent readers don't choose reading for pleasure because it's hard work and um, not comfortable, so they actually don't choose it for something to do for fun, which then compounds the problem because we know that good readers become better readers by reading more. And uh, for students who are disfluent who don't choose reading for pleasure, that then reduces the amount of time that they are in text, reduces the amount of vocabulary words they take in through the text, and reduces the opportunity to build comprehension skills. So um, that's a big issue for kids who are disfluent readers. They often skip words, and what we are learning through disciplinary literacy and math and science and social studies is that some of those content areas are highly dependent on every single word. For example, we learned that in math, math experts read every single word in a math problem or a story problem and give uh, deep consideration to each and every word. And when you skip a word, it makes a big difference in the meaning or the problem that is hidden within the math passage. So this creates a big issue for kids who are reading in the content area. And they often don't form connections between the word that they're reading right now and how they read it last time. So the pronunciation and the context and the meaning of the word is not connected from how they read it um, prior compared to students who are pretty comfortable with reading, they see the relationship between reading that word a few days ago in a different context and knowing its pronunciation, meaning, and um, place in the new text. So those are a few characteristics of disfluent readers. We, I asked you to write down what are some of the attributes of a good reader, a fluent reader. They read every letter within the word. That is a big uh, point right there because disfluent readers read every word. Uh, sorry, um, let me go back for just one second and show you. They read word by word. What we notice um, with fluent readers is they first attend to every letter in the word because they know that the letters hold the, um, the graphemic awareness, so they hold the relationship between the 
the way the letters are, are put together and the sounds that are made and then blending them into a word. We talked about that in the phonics webinar. We also noticed that fluent readers read almost every word. So there are uh, some words, and this is a big deal with math, as I just mentioned. Um, fluent readers read almost every word. However, um, in, a, in a content area such as math, I was just mentioning that every single word holds value. So fluent readers have to be, even be taught that in math text, it's really important not to skip words because sometimes fluent readers will um, read almost every word, but um, not actually every single word, but they look at things in a phrase and in a chunk. One of our goals is to be sure to teach kids in some disciplines, you have to go back and be sure you read every word. Fluent readers also break their words into syllables. They understand that when they come to a big multi-syllable word, they break it down into syllables, put it back together, and then they're able to decode that word. They also rely little on context clues. Context clues is one of their last strategies to employ and because sometimes there can be great error in figuring out a word um, based only on context clues. If they don't look at all the letters and they don't look at the vowel patterns and they don't look at the digraphs and diphthongs and syllables within the word and they only use context, there's a, a high margin for error. When they read, they sound like they are speaking. There's a rhythm and a flow to it, and it's not choppy, and you can actually listen to it as though someone were speaking. They also activate their vocabulary while they are reading. As we talked last time in the um, processing, the brain processing, if the student doesn't have to attend to um, great effort with decoding, they can then use the majority of their brain space for comprehension and activating vocabulary. They also use their knowledge base to predict what comes next. So just as we spoke about with all that brain space for comprehension, they can activate their background knowledge and then be able to think about what might be coming next in the text because they're not working so hard to decode the words. And their attention is focused on connections and comprehension, not necessarily the words. So this, this um, particular list ties very closely back to the phonics and advanced phonics webinar that we just um, finished together. And just a reiteration of the four processors in the brain, um, as spoken by Louisa Motes, and that the fluency is only possible when all of the processors are engaging together. So phonological, as we learned in the very first webinar, that's about sounds within our language, within our words, within our sentences. Orthographic is being able to take the symbols and map them to the sounds and put them into words. Meaning, as we know, has everything to do with comprehension and context as well, taking in a portion of um, uh, what we're reading and, and what kind of context it's set within. So it's very critical that all of the foundations of decoding are in place so that we can actually engage the comprehension portions of our brain as well. When you look at Polkowski and Chard's research in 2005, they had nine steps that we can actually use to build fluency. The first step uh, is to really work on phonemic awareness, letter knowledge, and phonics. That's the reason that in this webinar series, those two webinars came first, because it's a very um, foundational piece of work we need to do before we can address the concept of fluency. Another way that we can really support fluency for our students is to increase our vocabulary and oral language skills. It's one thing for a student to decode the word but not know the meaning of the word. And what we find is that if a student can decode the word and they read it, but the word doesn't hold any meaning for them, students tend to slow down and try and figure out what's actually going on in the text because they don't understand the vocabulary and the meaning. So that's a significant contributor to the idea of fluency. We can also effectively teach high-frequency words. Remember, one of the characteristics of a disfluent reader is that they actually try to sound out irregular words or high-frequency words when they should be able to read them with automaticity and not be able to not slow down. 
As mentioned in the phonics webinar, teach common word parts and common spelling patterns. We talked about prefixes and suffixes and root words and word origins and multisyllable um, decoding and vowel patterns and uh, digraphs and trigraphs. So step number four, it's very important for us to teach the students those word parts so that they can uh, tackle an unfamiliar word with, um, with efficiency and effectively. Also being able to provide students time in appropriate texts. Many of you um, have had a, a long history of understanding the idea of um, that sweet spot, just right instructional text for kids where they are able to, um, it's at their um, independent level. So when you are working on the idea of fluency, you don't necessarily build fluency always with instructional level. You want the text to be just a little bit easier at their independent level, and then they can work on their automaticity and expression and prosody. So being really careful to provide enough time in text at the independent level so that they can build fluency. Being able to use guided oral repeated reading strategies is also a big help. We're going to go through a couple of those today that produce high engagement and high yield. And um, we'll talk also about those activities that are low engagement and low yield. So we'll spend some time on number seven. <clears throat> number eight is being able to support and encourage wide reading. Wide reading means that students are reading in a variety of texts and a variety of genre and that um, they are spending a good amount of time reading uh, in their day and also outside of the classroom. So being sure that kids get a lot of exposure to different types of reading. And then number nine, being able to implement a screening and progress monitoring assessment so that we have a quick alert three or four times a year as to which students might be struggling in the area of fluency, both at the skill level and at the passage level. What I'd like you to do now is take a moment and pause the webinar. I'd like you to turn and talk to your partners about two or three things that have been either confirmed for you today or that are new that you're giving some thought to. So please pause the webinar. And if you're by yourself today, please jot a few notes down, some couple of things that are new or confirmed for you. And I'll see you back in a few minutes. Welcome back. Very good. Nice job. As we look at the convergence of research, we want to take um, a couple of minutes to think about the big ideas. Why would fluency be important? Why would we be talking about it? Why is it something that we should address with our students? And as you can see, there was research done in 2002. The more attention readers must give to identifying the words, the less attention they have left to give to comprehension. That's a really nice way of saying that um, when the brain is processing at the decoding level, it holds much less space for comprehension. So that's a, a really nice way. Sometimes I've seen teachers use this particular um, research information to share with parents because it's such a nice way to say it. The more attention readers must give to the words, the less attention they have to give to comprehension. It's a very simple way to say that. Then also you'll notice that reading requires the coordinated use of multiple brain processors. This is what Louisa Motes was speaking about, that being able to read requires that you activate all the processors within the brain and that anytime you don't have all four of them um, activating together, then you don't really have um, the, the reading strength that you would wish for for a kid. And then, um, as we just spoke about with Polkowski and Chard, effective fluency instruction encompasses nine key steps, which we just went through. As we talk, I want to visit a little bit about um, the assessment system and how we think about measuring uh, fluency or using fluency as an alert. Many folks say to me, I, uh, I'm not comfortable with something like Ames Web or Dibbles because it's just about reading fast. And my kids actually are a little bit slower than that, and I don't think it's actually a valuable measure because it doesn't measure deep comprehension. 
So when we talk about universal screening with fluency, it's not intended to measure deep comprehension. There's been significant research that shows that these measures reliably predict where a child is going to be performing um, in their early grades compared to their later grades. So there's been quite a bit of research. Uh, Connie Jewell has done research that shows that where our students, are, students who are reading with fluency at the first grade level are highly likely to be reading at grade level in the fourth grade level. Students who read with poor fluency in the first grade level are highly likely to be off grade level readers or behind um, in the fourth grade. So when we look at Ames Web, Dibbles, or fluency measures, we are looking for an early indicator of risk. And the convergence of research tells us that these fluency measures are a quick alert to risk. They're never meant to be a deep comprehension measure. They are meant to tell you, ah, there might be trouble here with this student for being able to be an on-grade level reader in the future. So <clears throat> they are going to help us get a quick alert on who might need additional help. So let's talk about some of those attributes of a screening assessment. Fluency screenings can be given quickly, and they are easy to score. So they are not indicators of deep reading ability. And they are not thorough assessments of reading skills. So anytime folks say, oh, that Ames Web, it doesn't measure comprehension in a deep way, the answer to that is you're absolutely right. It's letting us know which kids might be having trouble with the decoding part and the automaticity of reading. They're not designed also to diagnose specific reading difficulties. When we talked at the phonics webinar, we really got a better picture of how you might be a little bit more diagnostic for specific reading difficulties. And the fluency measures are not designed for that. So sometimes teachers get frustrated because they want the, the Ames Web or Dibbles or something like that or um, Easy CBM to be a, a diagnostic measure. They want it to um, help us figure out what's causing that reading trouble. And they're not designed for that. They're, they're designed to let us know who is struggling so that we don't have any kids who are invisible. And then once we find out who is struggling, it's our job to diagnose why they are struggling. So the screening assessment is a quick alert for who. It can help us answer this question. Is the student reading as well as we would expect for his or her grade level? So one of the most important concepts with the universal screening measures is that they are always given at grade level because you're trying to find out is that student reading at, uh, at a similar uh, uh, pace with his or her peers across a large data set or across the nation. So this is the key question. Is the student reading as well as expected for his or her grade level? And it may be in the area of comprehension that this student is actually not reading as well as they are, should be with their peers but in terms of decoding and fluency, they're doing just fine. So for students who do well on the fluency assessments, who do not do well on comprehension assessments, like the SBA, we then still have some work to do. So fluency is not a, a, an end-all, be-all, but it actually is a quick indicator for us. It's important that we understand that there are two ways to measure fluency. One is at the skill level, and one is at the passage level. So we're going to take a couple of minutes and talk about fluency at the skill level. Many of you use the Ames Web measure, and it measures letter sound fluency. That is measuring the student's ability to automatically associate the sound with the symbol. So when they see the symbol of a T, they know that that sound that's represented is T. When they see the symbol of, the, of M, they know that the sound that goes with that is mm, and that's the automatic sound symbol relationship. And we have found that that to be very important when students are approaching unfamiliar words. Letter naming fluency. That measures the student's ability to automatically name the symbols of the alphabet. There have been many, many research studies done that shows that in the middle of kindergarten, letter naming fluency is highly predictive of 
grade level reading later in a student's reading career. So letter naming fluency, that automaticity and the recall of the symbol has been shown to be very indicative of students reading strength or struggle in the teacher. Phonemic segmentation. When we did our phonemic awareness webinar, we talked a lot about this. As you know, there are 11 skills within phonemic awareness, and phonemic segmentation is one of the ways that we measure how students are likely doing with phonemic awareness. It measures the ability for a student to isolate the phonemes. For example, if I said the word fast, the student's job is to say fast and isolate the four phonemes. That is just a quick look for us into a student's ability with phonemic awareness. Um, it's not the only skill, it is just one of the skills that's been most highly correlated to students' reading success. Nonsense word fluency is probably the most misunderstood measure in, um, in the um, universal screening measures. And that is because we don't actually teach students to read nonsense words. We wouldn't do that. We want to teach kids to read words with meaning. However, we measure with nonsense word fluency because it tells us how well a student can automatically demonstrate sound symbol blending. In the phonics webinar, we talked about the closed syllable, which is consonant, vowel, consonant, and that 50% of our words are made up with closed syllables. This measure helps us know how well students are doing with closed syllables, with short vowels and consonant vowel consonant. And being able to take the M, the A, the N, and put the M, A, N sounds with them and blend them into a word or a unit, man. So the reason that we use nonsense words is so that students don't, uh, we don't have an accidental um, sight word um, recording there. So that's the only reason that we use um, words that don't have direct meaning. So if you have W-U-V, the jo student's job is to say w of was. And although W-U-V holds no meaning, it tells you whether or not a student can take the W, the U, and the V, attach a symbol to it, and blend it into a word. And that's actually what we're looking for in the nonsense word fluency measure. So it's often misunderstood, and um, maybe this will help you on why we give that measure. So I'd like you to stop the video or the webinar for a minute and turn and talk to a partner about something in the last few slides that was either review, confirmed, or something new for you. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. So we'll finish up uh, the concept of universal screening at the passage level now. So the last set of slides that we just looked at was about fluency at the skill level. This slide is really about fluency at the passage level. There's a great deal of research that has converged upon the concept of measuring students' ability to automatically read a passage quickly and accurately. So RCBM, or Oral Reading Fluency, those are um, both um, acronyms that are used. RCBM is used in AIMSWeb, and Oral Reading Fluency is used in DIBBLES. They, these measures do not really measure comprehension. You can give the maze or the days portion with AIMSWeb or DIBBLES, and they do measure comprehension. But RCBM and Oral Reading Fluency measure students' ability to automatically read or decode the passage. So if you look at bullet number three, fluency is a positive contributor to comprehension, um, but it's not that this measure is not measuring comprehension itself. So when we look at a student's ability to read how many words correct per minute, we're looking at how automatically can a student read a passage. And as I've told you, I have four kids, and my youngest son, is uh, he's on the autism spectrum and is really a bright, sharp kid. Uh, he's actually 26 now, but when he was in um, fourth grade, he came to me and he said, Mom, I actually, I'm just not that interested in showing evidence and um, explaining how I got my answers anymore. 
and so I'm not going to be doing that. And I talked to him and said, Corey, on the state test, one of the ways you get points is to be able to defend your answer and r record your evidence and tell how you got your answer. And he said, yeah, I'm just, I'm not interested in that. And so I, I did all the things a mom would do, all the things an educator would do, tried to entice him, encourage him, motivate him, and he, he wasn't interested. So in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, he did not pass our state test. By then I had learned a few things about reading and realized, oh my goodness, I wonder if fluency is actually a factor here. The other thing about Corey is that he is blind in one eye, which actually has an impact on his reading, and he has been blind in one eye since birth. So um, we gave him a fluency measure. We checked out Ultimate Speed Reader from the library, so it was nothing fancy, and just a fluency check. We gave that to him, and his fluency was very, very poor at the passage level. So he was reading about this much of a passage that was about this long. We also noticed that his accuracy was very high. He was 100% accurate with reading the words correctly, but his rate was very slow, and it's because of his vision impairment and his tracking. So what we noticed is he was not reading enough of the content of the passage to even be able to comprehend it. So that whole behavior from fourth grade through eighth grade was actually a bluff. And um, I can tell you that because number one, it's humbling. Number two, I wish we would have done universal screenings when he was a younger student because we would have noticed it right away. Instead, I accidentally stumbled upon it based on some of the things that I've learned about reading in the past 10 years. So we then gave him a fluency intervention. It was still Ultimate Speed Reader on a CD on a computer, but it was actually helping him build his automaticity, build his rate to be able to move through the text more quickly so that he could actually take in more of the, of the meaning of the text and read farther. And I can tell you that he actually did pass the ninth grade um, state assessment. Um, and I think it has a great deal to do with the idea that he actually could read more of the passages and be able to understand them. I would love to tell you that that solved all of the issues with him um, in terms of his um, rebellion and, and easy to raise, which it didn't. But um, he's a great kid and uh, brings many things to our life that, that are wonderful. So. The reason I tell you that story is that even with my own family, and as educated as I was, I missed this concept with my very, very bright son. And um, we give a universal screening measure three times a year in the area of fluency for students so that we can catch kids like him and catch kids whose uh, automaticity is contributing to their poor comprehension. So. It doesn't measure comprehension, it just lets us know, ah, there may be a problem. And the problem may be at the decoding level, or the problem may be at the rate level, which was um, the example for Corey. So when we talk about rate, when I just tell you this story, um, we look at this picture here. And we look at these five, sorry, six planes that are flying together. And some people say to me, what is more important, rate or accuracy? And actually, neither of them are more important. They hold equal place. So if any one of these pilots were to decide they were going to fly a little bit faster or a little bit slower, it would be quite an issue for the other pilots. And if any of them decided that they weren't going to really fly on their flight coordinates, they were just going to go a little higher or a little bit lower, that would also be a big issue for the other pilots. So rate, meaning the speed at which the pilots are flying, and accuracy, meaning flying directly on the flight pattern that was agreed upon with the flight coordinates and the way that they're supposed to be, both of those are significantly important and have, would have a big impact if they were to make um, one more important than the other. So words correct per minute. When I was talking to you about the story with Corey, I talked about words correct per minute. That is rate. So how quickly are the words read um, is something we're looking for with our universal screening measure. And those targets are set by norms or benchmarks, and they are set at a grade level. 
Hasbrook and Tyndall, Jan Hasbrook um, and Jerry Tyndall, are two of the probably leading researchers on the concept of words correct per minute. And through hundreds of thousands of students, they have established the norms for each given grade level. So the way you calculate word correct per minute is the number of words read correctly in a minute um, minus the number of errors. So that gives you rate. That's one of our first indicators to um, whether or not a student is decoding with automaticity. Then when you look at accuracy, this is another important piece that has come in in um, the last probably eight years of research. Diane Hager has done quite a bit of research here. Marcia Davidson has done quite a bit of research here. And here's what they have found, that from um, First grade to second grade, you can see that through the t um, time of the year that um, accuracy changes. But what you'll also notice is by the end of second grade that students need to be 97% accurate from then on in their reading career. And accuracy has a big place in our reading because if you um, if you have, uh, if you're wording, reading your words inaccurately, um, they hold the, they hold the key to the meaning within the text. So we find that accuracy is a major contributor. And what we're also finding is that we actually should be more worried about accuracy than fluency. So many of you teach in rural communities in Alaska, and some of your students. Um, um, are first Alaskans, and they may not read with a um, at a rapid rate, but their accuracy is very, very high. I am much less worried about a student who reads with 97, 98, 99% accuracy and is just a little bit slower in their rate than they should be, compared to a student who reads really fast with an accuracy rate of 92%. Because as they get to, to more intense text, deeper text, more technical text in other content areas, the accuracy of their reading um, contributes greatly to their comprehension. So we want to pay attention to both accuracy and rate. Here's just a little bit of an example. Even the smallest inaccuracy can make a big difference in understanding the, the sentence. So the first sentence is, the horse got a cold. The second sentence is, the horse got cold. So those hold very different meanings. One is the horse was, became sick, and the second is the horse was cold with their temperature, their, their body temperature felt cold. So very different meanings with just a little bit of inaccuracy. When we look at accuracy, we can look at something called a quadrant analysis. This helps us know which kids are struggling with just rate, which kids are struggling with just accuracy, and which kids might be struggling with both. So in the, phoneme or in the phonics uh, webinar, we talked about diagnosis, and um, we spent some time uh, on that a little bit. So we're also um, going to think about this quadrant in relationship to diagnosis. So the students up in quadrant one, they are kids who have both a high rate, which means they're reading at the right automaticity level, the right words correct per minute, and they're also reading with 97% accuracy. So that group of students really um, are, are at low risk, and we know that our job is to work with them on vocabulary and comprehension, that their fluency and their accuracy is right on target. When we look in stu with students in quadrant number three, they are reading at an appropriate rate. They are just not very accurate. And typically with this group of students, we ask them to just slow down a little bit and their accuracy comes up. They're just reading a little bit too fast and not attending to each and every word. So um, if you're taking notes today, and up in this quadrant, you might write, ask students to slow down and see if their accuracy improves. If their accuracy doesn't improve, you might need to do a bit of a diagnostic. Down below in quadrant number two, these are students who are like Corey. They have a low rate, so he wasn't reading nearly enough words per minute, but his accuracy was super high. 
This is the group of students that would benefit from an intervention such as Read Naturally, Six Minute Solution, or Fluency Practice. So will you circle that bottom left quadrant and write fluency practice or fluency intervention? Lots of times we put kids into read naturally or a six minute solution and they actually have a, an accuracy issue and they don't improve. Those particular interventions are designed just for these kids in this bottom left quadrant. Quadrant number four, low rate and low accuracy. So these are students who are below the words correct per minute target as well as below the accuracy target. Will you circle that group of kids and say informal diagnosis? So when we did the phonics webinar, we talked about the, um, the uh, something like the quick phonics screener or the core phonics survey. And that would be what you would administer with this group of kids here because we're not sure is decoding causing them trouble? Why are they struggling with low rate and low accuracy? And how, how do we provide an intervention for this, these kids? Because this group of kids, if we don't do something directly, will struggle with reading and are going to fall behind significantly if they aren't already. So this is just a way you can think a little bit about which students need which kinds of help. So the top left group of kids, your job is to focus on comprehension and vocabulary. The top right group of kids, you ask them to slow down a little bit, and you may need to do a diagnosis, but hopefully their accuracy comes up if they slow down just a bit. The bottom left kids, they are kids who need a fluency intervention. Read naturally, six minute solution, fluency practice, because their rate's not high enough. Then, bottom right, you do a diagnosis with those kids, an informal diagnostic, because we're not really sure why are those kids having so much trouble with both rate and accuracy. Please turn and talk to your partner for a minute about the last couple of slides and something new or confirmed for you um, related to the concept of fluency, and I'll, we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. So this is an AIMS web. This is called Scores and Percentiles. And this is an AIMS web um, representation. So for those of you who use AIMS web or Dibbles, here are some ways to look at this data. So <clears throat> the correct column is the words correct um, column. And the accuracy column is the column that tells us what percent of accuracy students had. So what I would like you to do quickly is go back and draw a quadrant analysis and label it like mine. I know that this is not mathematically correct, and um, uh, someone gave me this quadrant, and it's pretty hard to um, correct the numbers within it. So um, for those of you who are mathematic um, experts, I want you to know I know that this one is not mathematically correct. So please quickly draw a quadrant in, on your paper and label it like mine. Wonderful. Great job. Okay, so now we'll go back to the data. So when we look at the top child in the green, we'll call that child 954. We'll just look at the last three numbers. When we look at this child, um, the target, if you can see right before the green band, the target is 82 words correct per minute for third grade kids. That's a nationally normed target, um, as we talked earlier, based on national norms such as Hasbrook and Tyndall, this one's actually based on the Ames web norms. So this student in the green had 109 words correct per minute in the correct column. So they did a great job of meeting the rate target. So um, they're, they had uh, more than enough words correct per minute. So they are high rate. Then you notice, go over to the accuracy column, and that student had 99.1% accuracy. So they were above the 97% uh, accuracy target. So right above the word accuracy, will you please write 97%? Because that's, we know that's our target for kids in third grade, and, second grade and above. So that student, 954, would go in the upper left quadrant. So will you write 954 
in the upper left quadrant. So that student is doing fine with rate and fine with accuracy. Our work with them is focused on vocabulary and comprehension. So let's look at one more together, and then I'll give you a moment to do this by yourself. So 691, the student next down in the yellow. So we know that the target for the students at third grade was 82 words correct per minute. And this student in the correct column had 68 words correct per minute. So they were low rate. So this child was not automatic enough, not um, didn't read as many words correct per minute as they should for their age. But let's move over and look at the accuracy column, 98.6. So they definitely met the accuracy target. So this student, child 691, would go in the bottom left quadrant. And that means that student needs a fluency intervention. Read naturally, six minute solution, fluency practice, fluency activities in the core. So this student needs fluency practice because they're in the bottom left quadrant. What I'd like you to do now is pause the webinar for a moment, leave this slide up, and continue um, with the next set of kids that um, you see in the yellow and the red. And with your partner or by yourself, put them each in the quadrant where they belong. Remember that the words correct per minute target is 82 words correct per minute. We find that right under the green band. And then the target for accuracy is 97% based on research. So please quickly take the next, all the next kids in the class and put them in their appropriate con, uh, quadrant, and we will come back together. I'll see you in a minute. Wonderful. So let's do a double check of a couple of kids. So child 702, that child should be in the bottom right quadrant. They did not, they're 22 words away from the words correct per minute target as well as 95% accuracy. So that child, even though they're showing up yellow, I would probably do a quick diagnostic, informal diagnostic with them to find out is it multisyllable words? Is it vowel teams? Is it prefixes? Is it suffixes? What's giving this kid some trouble at the decoding level? Let's also pop down to child 665. So this child has data that was probably very similar to Corey's data when we did the ultimate speed reader. 48 words correct per minute, reading about half of the words in a minute that they should be. But accuracy is 98%. So all of the 48 words that the child read, um, most of those words that they read were read correctly, but they are reading very, very slowly. And eventually that's going to have an impact much like my son Corey, because they're not reading enough of the text to have good comprehension. So this child is, even though they're read, they're in the bottom left quadrant. So the first thing I would do with this child actually would be a fluency intervention like we did with Corey and see if their fluency came up to match their accuracy. And if, that's, if that was the case, then you would know, aha, we have the right intervention. So I might do that for three or four weeks with this child and then if they aren't responding, then I would actually give them a diagnostic and figure out why, what's causing this kid some trouble in that area. But the first thing I would do with child 665 is give them a fluency intervention consistently every day, fluency practice, so that they have an opportunity to improve that portion of fluency, which is rate. So even though this child comes up in the red category, we can still be very thoughtful with the quadrant analysis on how we're going to provide intervention support for that kid. I want to talk now about two different intervention approaches. One is programmatic. So you have heard me talk about Read Naturally and Six Minute Solution. That's a programmatic approach, meaning if the student struggles in this area, we're going to give them a program for their intervention. There's another approach that we can use in the area of fluency, and that's um, data or classroom di driven approaches. And we always want to be very, very sure that we are using research-based practices when we are designing intervention. So I'm going to talk to you about the research-based uh, fluency 
strategies that you can use with students. And we're also going to talk about a couple of them that are not research-based that you should absolutely not be having in your classroom. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Read Naturally and Six Minute Solution are programs you can buy, and um, most of them can be done um, either individually or in a small group, and you just follow, follow the program. Data or classroom-driven approaches that I'm going to share with you next can be done at any time of the day and can be done, as you'll notice, um, with groups, partners, or, um, or whole class. So let's take a look at that. So there are lots of strategies that can be built into your daily lessons that can build accuracy, rate, and expression. And when I say that, I mean not only in reading. So they should also be worked, fluency activities need to be involved in science and in social studies and oftentimes in math because accuracy um, needs to be really well built in the content areas as well. All kids need to hear and practice fluent reading all throughout the day. So I'm going to take each of those strategies and spend some time with them um, in the remaining time of our webinar. So this strategy is a good one for kids who are accurate but slow. So it's not an appropriate strategy for kids who are already fluent or who are already not accurate, and here's why. Kids who are already fluent don't need to do repeated readings. They actually should be working on vocabulary and comprehension. They don't need to do repeated readings of a given passage or a given paragraph or a given sentence. They, they were fluent enough the first time. Also, kids who are not accurate, what we find with repeated readings is that they continue to practice the words inaccurately. And if kids are inaccurate, we want to first correct them at the, at the word level and then go back and read the passages in a repeated reading fashion once they have the words read accurately. So this is a great strategy for kids in the bottom left quadrant. So focus practice can be done with letters, sounds, sight words, phrases, and connected text. So if you have kids who are inaccurate, you want to be sure that you go back and correct that, make sure that they are reading the letters, sounds, sight words, phrases accurately. So passages can be found any, anywhere. If you're going to practice with students at the passage level, you want the kids to be able to read the passage at their independent level, which is 95 to 97 percent accuracy. And that means that they are um, the, uh, sorry, at their instructional level. So you want to push their fluency just a little bit. So if you choose this strategy, we use it at least three times a week, and it only takes about five to ten minutes. And here's how it works. So you first give students a cold timing. That means the kids haven't read it before. So you give, you give them a cold timing, and it's time for one minute, and it's a brand new text. And then you write down um, how many words correct per minute they read. This next bullet, number two, is so important. The teacher models fluent reading of the passage and the students choral read with the teacher. So the teacher and the kids are reading together, and you may read it more than one time chorally. So you read through a couple of paragraphs or a paragraph, and then you go back and start again and read through a paragraph. At the end of the repeated reading of two or three times, then you share the information about the text meaning and unfamiliar vocabulary, not in the middle. So it's very important that we identify our, our goal or our, our priority when we're doing choral reading or, um, sorry, repeated reading. So the first bullet number one, that's just to take stock of where we begin. Bullet number two, that is guided practice. And the guided practice is for fluency. It is not for comprehension at that time. So you practice the fluency reading a couple of times, then you bring in the comprehension and the vocab. Then bullet number three, students practice the passage independently. They re read it a couple of times on their own independently. Then bullet number four is called a hot timing. You go back to that very same passage that you've been, that you were timed on at the beginning, that you read a couple of times, 
and that you practiced independently, and now you're going to read it one more time for fluency to see how many words correct per minute the student can read now. It's one thing to measure fluency, it's a different thing to build it. So bullet number one is measuring fluency on a passage never read. Bullet number two and number three is about building fluency. And bullet number four is about measuring fluency on the passages that you really did provide practice with. So it is not sufficient to do bullet number one alone. And if we're going to increase fluency, it's critical that we do bullet number two and number three. So that's one strategy called repeated reading, and it can be done chorally. One of the nice things about this is that it can be done any time of the day, and it can be done um, with a group of kids, and it just takes a couple of minutes, five to ten minutes, and bullets number two and three really help build student, student fluency. So many of you may not be using a tool like Ames Weber Dibbles and you're not sure um, what, what the goal should be, what kind of rate of increase we should be expecting. So Doug and Lynn Fuchs have done um, a lot of research on what kind of growth we should be expecting in our students. In the very first uh, column, these are realistic goals of um, what all kids should be able to um, grow. So in first grade, you'll notice two words a week. So kids' fluency is building at a rapid rate there, and the expectation for fluency to grow is two words a week. So that's eight words a month. That's a lot of growth. So we would expect students in three months to grow 24 words. So from winter, um, you may have students who read 20 or 24 words correct per minute in first grade, and by the end of the year, the expectation is 40 to 50 words correct per minute. So you can see that it's two words per week from winter to spring that um, research has shown our students should be growing. And then you'll notice that you get to sixth grade and it's um, three-tenths of a word per minute, 0.3 words correct per minute, or, or, uh, per week. And we know that, we know that um, fluency is that actually kind of levels out and um, the rate of change is not so high as students get older. So fluency is a big focus for our kids when they are in first and second and third grade. Once they have that fluent ability to read fluency, fluently tucked into their tool belt, we see um, that rate of change flatten out. You'll also notice in the right column for students who are behind, or um, if we are looking at setting ambitious goals, you'll notice these are the goals in the second column. So for kids in second grade who are behind, they need to grow at least two words correct per minute, and that's ambitious. We have a lot of work to do to help our kids um, be able to make that rate of change. So this is just a chart for you to use um, about when you're thinking about setting goals for kids and what should a, a, a typical um, rate of improvement B each week. Sticky reading. <clears throat> this is a little bit different than repeated reading because it has less of the student modeling. I'm going to actually go back for a minute. Lots of you know about Anita Archer's um, approach, I do it, we do it, you do it. And one of the things we know for kids who are struggling is that the we do it needs to be much more frequent. So um, I do it, which is the teacher modeling, then we do it, the choral reading with the teacher, and the more the students struggle, the more they need the we. So for kids who are in tier one, it's I do it, I do it, we do it, we do it, you do it, you do it. For kids who are in tier two or three, it is I do it, I do it, we, 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 we do it, we do it, we do it, we do it, you do it. So that's actually um, a major construct of repeated reading strategy different than sticky reading. So you'll notice that sticky reading is mostly dependent on the kid. So you give each kid three post-its, three, three, um, three stickers um, with, with the passage. So the students whisper read for one minute. At the end of one minute, they put a sticky on the end of the last word that they read, or they could just mark it with a marker or pencil. 
So they whisper read. That's very important. It's much more important that they whisper read than silent read. The older kids get, the more that silent reading would be okay. The younger a student, the, the more important it is that they whisper read. Another way to think about this is while they are all silent reading, if they are older kids, your job is to move around the classroom and just lean in. When you lean in, the student knows that their job is to move from silent to whisper reading right where they are reading. But I prefer to have kids whisper read um, for one minute because then I can actually see the active engagement. At the end of one minute, they go back to the beginning of that passage and you time them again for another minute. And their goal is to move through that passage farther than they did the first time and they put another sticky. Then you repeat it one more time. So you ask students to observe how much more automatic they were by number three and have them think about why do they think they got this far. Number one, they, they decoded the words already a couple of times. Number two, they were um, able to push themselves a little bit because they were familiar with the passage. So one concept that we don't teach children well enough, um, especially in content areas, is the need for rereading. And um, the need for rereading both for automaticity and for comprehension. So this helps kids understand that you um, actually can get a great deal of benefit from when you reread. Then, uh, on the bottom, as with any new strategy, the teacher first models it, then they practice it, and finally the kids do it on their own. So this may take a couple of times of modeling and guided practice before kids are really able to execute it. But it's just a, um, a more independent version of repeated reading, and this helps to build fluency. Partner reading. Research has shown that partner reading or pairing of um, students in reading a text has an impact on their reading achievement. Most of the time when partner reading, um, when teachers don't do partner reading, it doesn't have anything to do with the concept of reading. It has to do with the management of it. So I want to give you a couple of things to think about with partner reading. Number one, intentional pairing of students. So students are often paired low to medium, medium to high. Um, and um, actually this should say highest readers in triads, so I'm sorry about that. It should say highest readers in triads, not lowest readers. Um, so if you have a group of three, you want to be sure that those are your highest readers because um, they tend to be just a bit more independent. So you would not put a low struggling reader with a high reader because it creates frustration on both sides. So the teacher creates the pairs. Also, um, Let's look down at bullet number two. So there are some important procedures that have to be modeled in practice. Number one, the seating arrangement. So I've seen lots and lots of partner reading activities go astray because a partner will head off over here or head off over here. They spend the majority of the partner reading time trying to decide where to sit. Secondly, the partners are assigned in advance. I've seen teachers who have partner reading pairs um, up on the board and they, they stay there for a couple of weeks or months and they are assigned in advance. There's no discussion, um, not choosing. We don't self-select our partners. It takes, number one, too much time and most of that is built upon um, social interaction, not um, academic focus. So then you decide quickly who's number one and number two in the partnership. It should take just a moment and they stay number one or number two throughout their partnership assignment. And part of that is that I've seen a lot of kids when partner reading begins, they try to decide who goes first. So I went first last time, no you go first, no I went first, you go first. I don't want to, it's your turn. So a great deal of time is wasted with partner reading if you're trying to decide who is going first. Number one, go first today, that's it, it's over. Tell students what to do when finished with the passage. So you have all different rates of um, reading, and you'll have some students who finish first. And as Anita Archer says, um, avoid the void. So we know that partners who finish first will find something else to do, and it's probably not something you want them to be doing. So you want to tell the kids, um, that they automatically know that when they finish the passage, they go back to the beginning, start with a different partner, and begin to read again. And that they continue to read in that loop until partner reading time is over. So some groups may have read that passage three times, while other kids may have just read it once, depending on their 
um, their automaticity. But you want kids to go back to the beginning and reread again rather than finding something else to do. The other thing you want to be really articulate about is the length of reading between changing partners. So I learned some very interesting things last week about narrative and informational text. And there's some research out on it now that gives us some very, very important concepts here. So at the sentence level and the page level, those can be alternated for narrative text. The recommendation for partner reading for um, nonfiction text is that you read in chunks of paragraphs. And that's because nonfiction text is organized with the main idea and details in each paragraph. If you're reading at the sentence level with non-fiction text, you lose the context of it. So when you're having kids do partner reading with informational text, please be sure to tell them that they're going to alternate every paragraph. With narrative text, such as dialogue, um, things like that, you can have them alternate at the sentence level or you can have them alternate at the page level. One of the things you want to be careful about when you assign pages for them to alternate, um, there's, there's a high possibility of kids disengaging because they know they aren't going to read for the whole page. So typically, sentences or paragraphs is the way you would alternate who reads what. Being very careful with informational text to teach them to alternate at the paragraph. And then when you get to correction procedures, what do we do if a partner who's reading doesn't know a word? And you want to teach them how to ask the question, can you figure out that word? Do you want them to sound it out together? Do you want the partners to tell the word? So the correction procedure when they come to a word they don't know is important to, to teach them as well. So these are just some helpful hints with partner reading because partner reading has been shown to be highly effective in building fluency and comprehension. But we notice that mostly the management of partner reading is the barrier for teachers. So hopefully these things will help. Will you pause the webinar for just a moment and turn to your partner or think to yourself, um, what about this particular um, last couple sets of slides has been helpful um, and confirmed or, or new for you? So I'll give you actually just a couple minutes for that and then come back together, please. Great. Welcome back. All right. We have a couple more to go through and then we are good for today. So choral reading. That is when all of the students read together with you. So the reason that you use choral reading, and number one, is it helps build efficiency. The other is that students, um, uh, it's called miles on the tongue. So students are spending a good amount of time engaged in the text. Anytime you have an activity, you want to think about the engagement level, and you want it to drop no less than 50% if you can help it. So choral reading, all students are reading together. That's 100% engagement. So let's go back for a second to partner reading. Partner reading is a 50% engagement. So 50% of the class is reading at one time, and 50% of the class is listening. So choral reading, 100% of the kids are reading. Anytime you can have 100% activity, it is better than 50. Anytime you have 50, it's better than anything below. You try not to drop down below 50% engagement. So the key for choral reading is to say, keep your voice with mine, and we're going to read with fluency and expression. So the student's job is to keep their voices with the teacher, and the teacher is going to push the edge just a little bit for rate and is going to model expression. For example, you could say, um, students today, we're going to work on attending to punctuation. So we're going to really pay attention that when we get to a period, we're going to stop. When we get to an exclamation mark, we're going to read with excitement. When we get to a question mark, we're going to bring our voice up in annotation. Um, so really paying attention to what you're going to model for the day and what kids are supposed to be attending to when they read with you. So choral reading helps um, with engagement and helps kids be able to read all together and um, push their fluency just a little bit. And this can be done with any content area. Story reading with parts. So um, the reason that I call this story reading with parts instead of reader's theater has to do with engagement. So um, 
you can use curriculum passages that lead themselves to a reader's theater style. But I want us to think for a second about the engagement level. So sometimes when I'm in classrooms, I see reader's theater happening, and I see one kid having one part. So let's say they're doing the little red hen. One's the hen, um, and each of the other children are a different animal. And when that child's um, part comes, when the little red hen's um, dialogue comes, she reads that dialogue. But she only ends up reading about two or three sentences in the reader's theater, and she's the only one who reads those. Let's think about how we can increase that engagement. So the reader's theater um, interaction um, with, with, um, with reading is not a poor activity, but let's think of how we could raise our engagement level. If you assigned multiple students to each part, it's maximizing the time that every kid is reading. So if you had six little red hens, and when the little red hen dialogue comes, all six are reading that together and you had six boxes or six um, bears, then when their passage part comes up, there are many more kids reading than one child with, with 12 kids listening. That engagement level is far below 50%. But if you have kids having um, multiple students reading the part, it is dramatically changing the engagement level. So reader's theater, I prefer to speak about story reading with parts so that there are multiple kids reading. Then, really quickly, uh, about uh, helping students with their phrasing. So reading phrases with good expression can be taught, correct, taught um, directly. So on the overhead, um, or on your smart board, or with a document camera, you put a, a sentence or a couple of sentences, and the teacher models scooping um, with phrases rather than reading word by word by word. Remember, disfluent readers, we read word by word by word. And kids who are fluent read in phrases. So um, on the airplane, the people sat quietly when they were receiving their instructions from the pilot. So the teachers model the scooping process in terms of reading phrases. And then the text can be written. Um, in phrases and brought close together. Um, also, um, students can use an eraser of a pencil when they are scooping through their text. So I've seen teachers who have up on the smart board and then students have their own um, sentences and they just use the eraser of their pencil to move along and scoop with the, the teacher as they read. Um, you can use the other part of your pencil as well, but even in a textbook, um, you wouldn't necessarily want to write on the on the book, but I've seen them just take their eraser and um, practice reading and phrasing, which helps build fluency as well. That can be done in any content area as well. Really quickly, I do feel very strongly that we need to address the idea of round robin reading because I can't um, tell you how many times I see round robin reading in classrooms where I observe, with exception. It is really only used in small groups. So if you have a highly intensive group and you have five kids with you, then it's, um, it's, it's a practice that you could use. But it would only be for the purpose of monitoring their progress. Because if you have a group of 30 and you are doing round robin reading, your, in, your engagement level is so low. The other thing is we know all of the things that happen with round robin reading. Um, number one, inattentive behaviors because there's only one kid on the hook. Number two, you are oftentimes modeling poor or inaccurate reading. And as much as possible, we don't want to do that. Um, you also promote anxiety or embarrassment. You um, allow others um, to correct before self-correcting. So sometimes um, other, other kids will do the correcting. And it consumes valuable time. The one thing that I, uh, when I talk to the leading researchers in the nation, it is very baffling because this is the one practice that has been shown to be highly ineffective. And there is no, not an ounce of research that supports that when you have a large group of students together, that round robin reading has any effect size on increased achievement at all. And yet it is the one practice that we see teachers using most often in whole group reading. 
And so when I speak about partner reading, choral reading, um, sticky note reading, um, reading words, reading with parts, all of those are better than round robin reading. And it, what we have found is that when teachers go into their lesson plans or into their teacher's edition, if they insert choral reading, uh, partner reading, into their teacher's edition, there's been a study that's been, it's not quite finished, but it's being done right now on just the idea that teachers go into their lesson plans and insert the other kinds of strategies and take out round robin reading that in student achievement has gone up. It's the one practice that there's no research on it to be effective, and it is yet the one that we do the most. And um, so I'd really challenge you to examine your own practice, examine how often you do choral reading, uh, I'm sorry, round robin reading, whether it's math, science, social studies, reading, reading instruction, this structure is actually one that's never helpful in a whole group. The only exception is in a small group where you actually have to monitor progress of kids who are struggling with reading and that shouldn't be used very often, okay? All right, here are, to close up for today, six things you can do to develop fluency. You can model fluent reading, model it with your kids, you can provide direct instruction and feedback. So we actually teach kids how to build their automaticity with words, teach kids how to build their porosity or their expression, and we give them feedback on that. We provide reader support, so choral reading, echo reading, partner reading, sticky note reading. We provide a way for kids to be able to enter into that text as much as possible. We use repeated readings of one text three or four times so they actually become automatic with it. We cue the phrase boundaries, so that really means that we are helping kids read with phrases rather than word by word. And we also provide students with material that's easy to read while we are working on building their fluency. We also support and guide and encourage wide reading of a variety of genre, a variety of text, and in many places in their day and at home. And we promote reading opportunities throughout the day as well as at home. So I hope today that you found um, one or two things that um, were helpful for you in building fluency. Fluency is not um, a, a result that um, we would expect to see happening for kids without instruction and without practice, just like everything else. And um, fluency is one of the things that is an indicator for us of a reading difficulty. So uh, with your partner, I'd like you to name one or two specific things that you'll be taking away in your classroom and talk with them about why this is your strategy. I'll give you two minutes to do that and we'll come back together. Great. So here are a couple of resources. Goodbye Red Round Robin um, by Tim Rosinski is a book that really speaks about this idea about round robin reading and how can we do other activities to build fluency. Intervention Central is a wonderful website for you to be able to go to for all kinds of fluency building activities and fluency building ideas. So I wanted you to be sure to have that website. And there's also a fluency list attached um, with this webinar that you could use as a resource. So it has been delightful to spend time with you today. Thank you so much for working so hard. And I look forward to um, getting a chance to see you in the next webinar, which would be vocabulary. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.